Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. We want to let you know that we have once again been honored with a nomination for the Hockey Podcast of the Year via the Sports Podcasting Awards. And all you need to do to help us is go to OurKidsPlayHockey.com and click on the Vote Now button. It asks you a couple questions. You're in and you're out, and you have voted for us for Hockey Podcast of the Year. I want to thank you all for being a wonderful, wonderful audience and helping us get to this stature of hockey podcasting because we've done it as a family, as the hockey friends and families around the world. Thanks so much and enjoy this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. Hello, hockey friends and families around the world, and welcome to another episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. I'm Lee Elias, and I'm joined, as always, by Christy Casciano burns and Mike Benelli, and I'm pleased to welcome to the show today, Joe Eppolito. For the last 27 years, Joe has worn many hats at the state level, as well as nationally with USA Hockey. He's been involved in hockey as a longtime high school coach, New York State Amateur Hockey Association board member, USA Hockey District Director, National Tournament Committee member, an official and a hockey parent above all. A former teacher, Joe has a tremendous resource for New York State, and he's been helping to build and relay coaching development curriculums for thousands of coaches in his role with USA Hockey's coaching education program. Due to the pandemic, the CEP, which is the coaching education program, clinics shifted from uh, in-person to virtual classrooms, and Epolito played an integral role in making those successful in New York State. Joe is also a big advocate of growing girls and women's hockey. He has been a New York State Amateur Hockey Association girls and women's section coordinator since the year 2000, and is also uh, running the girls' side of their player development committee. He was recently named the 2021 Walter Yawchuk Award winner for all of his tireless volunteer work on and off the ice, and we are privileged to have him with us here today. Joe, welcome to Our Kids Play Hockey. Thanks for being here today. Thanks, Lee. It's a pleasure. I'm looking forward to our conversation today. I am too. I'm hoping the listeners are too. So, Joe, the first question I have for you, it's kind of an obvious one, but uh, you know, we talk on this program all the time, coaching and teaching go hand in hand. You know, coaching is teaching. So as a former teacher yourself, how did that background help you become a better coach to coaches in delivering the coaching education curriculum uh, through USA Hockey? Well, that's, that's a great question, Lee. And to be honest with you, so when I first got involved with USA Hockey, I was asked a long, long time ago as a high school coach, and I was asked by our local USA Hockey organization to attend a clinic, a coaching clinic around something called the initiation program. And the initiation program was basically a, a program that was stolen by USA Hockey uh, from Hockey Canada. And its focus was on growth and development, especially at the younger, lo younger levels, looking at things like small area games and things along those lines. So I went to this clinic and, and I was kind of a cocky high school coach and thinking, oh, I'm not going to learn a thing, you know, by going to this clinic. And when I got there and, and realized that this program was so kid focused and so uh, learning centric and, and making the game be the teacher. I was completely blown away by it. And, and from that point, completely converted to that kind of philosophy in, in, in terms of growth and development for players. Wide, wide opening. It was just a, a phenomenal experience to be able to expose, to be exposed to that kind of programming. And, and as an educator, you fall in love with it. Uh, it's, it's very systematic. And, and the thing that I also liked about it is that, that it would give people that basically don't have a, uh, any kind of degree in education, uh, the tools needed to be able to actually be good coaches and help kids develop. So for me, that was integral part of uh, a part of it. And, and, and I've been a strong believer of that ever since. And, and it's one of the most things, one of the things that I cherish the most, most about being involved in hockey is coaching education. You know, if I may uh, pull a thread on something you just said, especially for the younger coaches out there, you alluded to this, uh, that you had gone to that meeting with the kind of that attitude of, oh, I might not get anything out of this, right? Um, I think it's an important thing to bring up because so many times in my life, especially especially when I was younger, I, I would go with that attitude. I almost always end up learning something. And as I got older and, and more experienced in coaching, I started looking forward to those types of events because you, you really never know what you're going to get out of them. You know, I've said this quote before, and you embody this, Joe, um, you know, that that good coaches think they know everything, but great coaches no, they don't know anything at all, right? You can always be learning, right? So I, I just want yeah. to bring that up, not, not to focus on the fact that you did that, but that you, you went beyond that, right? And I think that's just an important tip for all coaches, really all educators, right? That you, the, the learning never stops for, for people in that role. 
Yeah, so I recently just attended some some training in Detroit, and um, basically it's becoming what's called a, a mentor coach developer. So basically, it's training the guys who train coaches. So we got an opportunity to be involved in that. And one of the themes of that was being a lifelong learner. So as coaches, as players, uh, you know, we want to be able to learn from the sport. Right. We want to be able to learn from our colleagues. You know, in, in any way that we can make the game better and make our kids better and our coaches better. You know, we need to um, uh, embrace that and, and embody that and, and live by that uh, mantra. And it was really kind of the focus of our training. And uh, it's something to live by. It's, 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 it's a way to make the game more enjoyable for all involved. I agree with you. That is so important because I think there, there is a contingent out there who uh, are no one else. <laughs> and at some point they stop learning because they think they know it all. And that's a huge mistake, especially when you're trying to develop kids. Yeah, you know, another aspect is, you know, the game is changing. Our game is completely changed. It's not the way that it used to be. So, you know, if we aren't, if we don't continue to be lifelong learners, we don't become better as coaches. And, and you know, all you got to do is watch the NHL, watch the playoffs, watch college hockey, watch girls and women's hockey at the highest level. And, and you know that the game is, is evolving and changing. Um, most recently, like uh, this weekend, we had the USA Hockey Annual Congress. And, and uh, every few years, there are changes this year. Uh, was a playing rules change year and a couple of huge uh, rule changes that will go into effect uh, this year have to do with uh, icing uh, when you're a man down and also the tag up off sides rules. So those rules have been drastically changed. So this is going to be another change to the game. And as coaches, uh, as, as developers of the game, you know, we have to embrace that. And, and, and use those rule changes to kind of help retool and reteach the game. So it's another aspect that I'm looking forward to get involved in and, and trying to think about how I'm going to change my coaching habits and my style, um, you know, to adapt and, and, and go with the changes in the game that are, you know, are, are there all the time now. Yeah, I think, I think when, when you talk about, um, you know, those changes and those lifelong learner opportunities, I mean, one of the things I've been fortunate enough to be, you know, on a lot of Joe's calls this last, this past year with the pandemic uh, CEP program being completely online and virtual, uh, one of the, I think one of the, the bonuses for me was that when you're, when you're at a, when you're, when you're at an onsite uh, CEP clinic, often like a guy like Joe Epolito will go up and speak and you'll go out into the hallway and, and you'll do your own thing and kind of get ready for your, maybe what you're going to speak on next. And the great thing about this is we're all in the same room and we get to, you know, me as a coach developer gets to learn from all the other coach developers and just hearing those little ways about, you know, how a guy like Joe and uh, Joe, how, how you taught and how you speak and how you articulate the program is maybe different from me and different from other folks. So I thought that was a great resource for me to sit down on those programs because it's just even the terminology of things you use that I wouldn't think about, you know, maybe using with certain coaches that, so that was great. And I think that was a real bonus of, you know, and, and we see that all the time. I think Joe and Joe knows this from being at all the level fives and fours, the pro coaches and the college coaches, the best coaches in the world that come and speak at these conferences, they sit in on the whole conference. Right. I mean, they sit there and they take notes in the back of the room. I mean, we were up in Lake Placid a couple of years ago and Bill Beanie's back there taking more notes than any other single person in the room. And he's probably one of the most accomplished coaches, you know, in the world at the college level. And I think to see that, uh, you know, is really refreshing, you know, for the know-it-all guys. Yeah. The other thing I really enjoyed about the virtual clinics is that, so in the past, when we would do coaching clinics, you would have pockets of coaches that would come from local organizations that aren't that far away. Where the virtual clinics, we had 40 people that would attend the clinics, but there would be coaches from California in the same clinic with coaches from Florida or New York or Texas. So the way that hockey's being taught, not only in New York state, but across the country, you know, we got to share some experiences and, and get this and got to see that, you know, there are a lot of things that are similar. There are a lot of things that are different, but it was just a different kind of a nationwide perspective. And that's, I think one of the strengths of, of this virtual clinic opportunity uh, is to be able to share your hockey story and your hockey experiences and your hockey expertise I want to say with people from across the country you know right. Joe I'll jump into that too you know I do a lot of work in team building it's one of my professional ventures if you will and you know one of the things we talk about with uh, strategic alignment is a shared consciousness right and ex expert communication 
And one of the things I think over the last year we've realized is that, as you just said, we can be in a room like this together nationally now. There's no, there's no, you don't have to just travel and just sit with the coaches in your region. And when I say shared consciousness and that information sharing, that communications forum, the amount of information that you can share now and the ability to do it. I think this is something that's uh, almost underestimated through time is that our ability to communicate now is better than it has ever been in the history of humankind, right? So there's more information, there's more ways to get it uh, than ever before. And like you guys are championing, championing that, excuse me, it's always a hard word for me to say. You know, another thing I wanted to say about, about evolving coaches, we, we've been saying the know-it-all. So if you're listening to this show, by the way, you're probably not a know-it-all because you're listening to the show. But one of the things I, I like to say is that, you know, coaches change, but so do kids. And I think that's something that we don't talk about enough, right? So, you know, as coaches, we get older, we get more mature, maybe, right? We learn, but, you know, an 18-year-old today is not an 18-year-old from the 90s, is not an 18-year-old from the 80s. You know, I remember um, when I was a young high school player, I had an old school coach, right? Grew up in the 60s and the 70s. He was a screamer, a uh, good guy, but very old school approach. I, I could tell that, right? And, and you can tell he was raised by a World War II guy. Like you could just tell, right? But, I mean, I have nothing but the utmo utmost respect for those people. Um, but I could also tell when I was 18 that his style was not resonating with a lot of the players, right? Uh, fast forward another 18 years. And if he would never be able to coach a, a group of 18 year olds today, just they, kids have changed. The game has changed. Coaching has changed. So I think the ability to be fluid like that, and Mike, as you say, continue to always take notes is a really important uh, thing for success. Never stop learning. You know, I, I think HBO did it. There was a great documentary on HBO where Bill Belichick and Nick Saban, they get together every year, right? These are the two greatest coaches in the history of football, and they still get together every year to learn from each other. Now, I, I imagine there's not many other coaches that they can get together that understand each other, Right. But it just it, it never stops. The learning never stops. Right. And that's that's just a point I want to make. And obviously would love your thoughts on that as well, that the, that the adults change, but the kids change, too. And that's important to note. Yeah, it's 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 such an evolving thing. And, and it's a focus in education across the board. I know that USA Hockey is very involved, deeply involved in trying to find ways to, to spread its message in a different way, you know, with the understand. And, and they've done actually some market research to determine, you know, how can we best take these, this multitude, this mountain of resources that we have available. Let's face it, as a coach, you can, go, you can go to any website and get a million different lesson plans to be able to teach. But you know, how do we get this information? How do we get these resources? How do we get them out to our, to our membership? And they're exploring a ton of different digital uh, avenues to be able to do that. Right. And, 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 it, and, and, and they just recognize that you know, kids today are, are very connected to their phones connected to the digital world. And as leaders in hockey, we need to be able to find ways to, to tap into that and to be able to, to, to shoot our messages in different ways than we have in the past. Unlike the screamer that you talked about, right. you know, we've all had those kind of coaches and, and, and that's another part of the evolution of the game and the evolution of the coaching aspect of it is to be able to adapt I mean, we have the coaching mobile app now. So right. if you if you are a coach and want, and want to go on the ice and, and, and you need to bring your practice plan before people would have it on a bar napkin, right. and now they actually <laughs> have it on their uh, they actually have it on their cell phone to be able to bring it out there. You know, right. so it's uh, it's it, and and it's something that people and 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 I'll be honest with you, there are coaches that are a little reluctant to get involved in that because they just aren't technologically savvy. But the ones that are truly into it and really want to make things grow are finding ways to adapt their coaching styles and they're finding ways to integrate uh, technology all across the board. It's evolving and it's going to be just like the game is. Yeah, I, I'll say this to follow up on that. Um, number one, it, let's just say you're not a tech savvy coach. Just some advice for our audience. You know, um, Instead of being embarrassed about it and shutting it away, fill that gap. Bring in a coach that is technologically savvy to help you. There's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes I feel like coaches are threatened by the technology if they can't use it. Trust me, one of the parents can use it. Somebody, I know there's politics to play into this, obviously, but part of being a great coaching staff is having an assistant coach or coaches that fill in the gaps that you don't have, right? Um, Joe, I'm also glad you bring up evolution. That's going to bring us to the next question. Um, you know, I remember in 2010, so I started coaching college hockey in about 2007. So I was very involved in everything that was going on. And in 2010, I'll never forget this. There was an article in USA Hockey Magazine that introduced the new ADM, the, the American Development Model. And it was going to change everything. 
And there's a lot of questions about what's going to happen with this. Well, let's just put it this way. You're starting to see the first athletes in the NHL now that grew up entirely in that program. So if that came around in 2010, uh, again, not, not so much just Connor McDavid, but Austin Matthews, you're starting to see a lot of players that grew up within that development model. And not only are they good, they're some of the best players in the game. So you have seen that transition of the game over your time in the game from, I'll call it the Neanderthal era that I played in, where, you know, you wanted to be 6'5", 250 pounds, Eric Lindros, you wanted to break someone in half, to the era today where it's streamlined, it's speed, it's fast, right? You don't have to be a Hulk to play hockey. Um, Tell me, as someone who's been around the game, right, how have you seen the program evolve? What are some of the aspects of the curriculum that you think make the most influence on coaches? And just tell us about your experience in the game over the last 27 years. Yeah, so I, I can tell you that uh, when the ADM first came out, everybody thought that it was focused primarily on just eight and under hockey. Right. And they didn't really understand that it's a, a true long-term athlete development model. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the difference. And, and it's research-based, it's science-based. It's to the point where um, the program has taken on such a, such a big meaning and, and has become an integral part of the USA Hockey DNA to the tune of, of the NHL supporting um, USA Hockey, you know, the, the, the NHL gives USA Hockey over $9 million a year to be able to supplement and, and support those programs because it's the right way to do things. And it wasn't just pulled out of the sky. It wasn't just right. pulled out of the rabbit's hat. You know, it was, a, it was, it was basically research-based and, and, and it didn't take like a couple of months to put together. This is, you know, a program that was really well thought out and, and you know, to the point where the NHL, listened to the research and said, you know what, that's going to do wonders for hockey in the United States of America. So let's, let's follow this model. And the model itself is, is evolving. It's, it, it's, it's maturing and, and, and it's becoming more, uh, more an integral part of what we do. Uh, you know, the cross ice aspects of that are huge. You know, you, if you go to any, an NHL practice or even a high level college practice, uh, a good majority of what they do is station based and, and, right. and, small area games cross ice types of stuff so the game has changed so much and and it, as a result the skill level in our players is becoming absolutely phenomenal you know and, and 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 it's just doing wonders in all aspects of the game one of the other things that's starting to evolve more now and it's also becoming a focus uh within usa hockey is goaltending you know goaltending is probably the most important position on any hockey team and yet there's been you know, not so much an emphasis or a priority uh, placed on that position. So I think that's beginning to change. USA Hockey now has, you know, goaltending clinics that are given specifically for that position. Uh, and, and that position is evolving uh, nationally as well. They, they have goaltending curriculums now that are instituted. They have gold, uh, silver, and bronze coaching clinics that coaches can receive just to specifically teach goaltending. So that's a major part of what's going on now as well. Um, and the, the curriculum within the coaching education program, which is uh, fostered and developed primarily by the ADM regional managers across the country, is, is really evolving and changing. Just this year alone, uh, we're going to introduce and roll out some other curriculums to help the coaches uh, in our program. But um, it's, it's continuing to change and, and, and looking forward to it. But the ADM is, is the foundation of where we're going, and it's slowly becoming um, you know, the DNA and what we do. Another effort that USA Hockey is undergoing right now uh, in, in an effort to try and change the game is they're, they're focusing on uh, diversity and inclusion, which is, which is really huge. You know, we need to do everything within our power to be able to get more kids playing the game from all races, religions, you know, sexual preference, whatever we can do to, 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 to get people to enjoy and be a part of this great sport. And when we do that, it's gonna make our game uh, even that much better. So those are some other efforts that are going on. Absolutely, and, and I'll say, Mike, then I'll, I'll jump to you or Christy. Uh, when it comes to the ADM specifically, and I don't wanna ignore what you just said about inclusion. Uh, if you look at how many World Junior Championships the USA has won since 2010, and it's not negating the championship before it, uh, and our international competition, the amount of American players that have entered uh, high levels of hockey or the NHL, the, the, the results are undeniable how impactful the ADM has been. 
Um, I'm glad you bring up an inclusion as well, because we're going to talk a lot about that. I know Christy's daughter is heavily involved in that. Obviously, this show is a major proponent for that. Um, and, you know, we're seeing that now really start to grab hold all the way up from athletes like Curtis Gabriel in the NHL and then all the way down to the youth levels where, uh, well, look, when I was growing up, I'll just say it. I mean, there's a massive stigma about it growing up um, to the point it was uncomfortable, right? Um, and now it's much more accepted. There is a toxic side to the hockey culture that that has to be changed. And we're definitely making the right steps to move past that. Again, Christy, I want to obviously dive into you here because because your daughter's heavily involved in that. Couple of, couple of things. And this, this was a flashback for me when you brought up uh, the cross ice hockey because my kids were little when that happened. They were playing full ice, Sophia in particular, playing full ice. I think she was six years old. And then they shrunk it to playing half ice. There was so much resistance. Parents went bonkers. They were so bad. They didn't get it. Totally didn't get it. Um, you know, they were yelling at the coaches. You know, our we saw our kids play full ice. We saw our kids get exhausted at age six trying to make it across the ice. Some of the kids could, but not, not all of them. And hardly any of them scored to half ice where they were all touching the puck and and getting a feel for, you know, scoring. It was such a huge difference, but the parents at the time didn't see it. They saw it as such a negative. So that's I, a I great example. I thought parents knew everything, Christy. The parents, <laughs> just, they know everything that's the right thing to do. You know, we should listen to the parent. No, I'm just kidding. I'm teasing. Yeah, but that's a great example of, you know, being resistant to something that, you know, people put a lot of study in and a lot of effort and a lot of research and it works and it's only going to make your kid better. But at the time, parents didn't see it. Um, and it, it got pretty ugly and nasty, <laughs> as I recall. So that's a great example of, you know, we have to learn, we have to grow, we have to be acceptant of changes. Um, so I, it's funny because as you were talking, Joe, it was just getting these visions of the, of the yelling in the stands about the, the cross ice hockey. Um, let's talk about diversity. Yeah, um, we need to make some gains here. And, it, and it's great to see the college kids uh, taking a leadership role here. Uh, there's a committee that's been put together with a D1 hockey player, Sophia's involved in it. And uh, they're still meeting. They met all during the college hockey season that wasn't much of a season for them. And they're still meeting. She just met last week and the kids are talking about maybe um, getting signs for every rink in the country. You belong here. So there's a lot of really good discussions being um, uh, researched and um, led by, by kids, by college kids, you know, who grew up playing hockey and now they're playing college hockey. And they can be real leaders in change, which is really exciting to see. Um, Joe, what other kinds of changes do you think the, the rest of us could do? You know, just every rink of the country can, can get involved in this. Absolutely. And USA Hockey's undergone, we were required as board of director members to actually undergo uh, 10, 10 hours of training uh, through um, uh, a couple of different companies that uh USA Hockey hired in a consulting role and just completed that, but it was it was it was multifaceted and it was fascinating and and you know, it was kind of neat because like Bill Daly, who was the uh, uh, second in command to Gary Bettman, was is is a member of the USA Hockey Board of Directors. He was involved in the training. We were in breakout rooms together, and it was just very interesting to see that you know the the NHL buys into diversity and inclusion across the board. And there's just so many different things that are that are being done. USA Hockey's actually hired uh, a person to chair or, or be in charge of a diversity and inclusion department. So USA Hockey's trying to undergo a number of different. Uh, initiative to try and uh, include that in what we do. I think the biggest part of that is that diversity is in, in, and inclusion isn't a cookie cutter. There's not a cookie cutter answer to that. And it's different from where you go. Right. So it's really about education and awareness to say that, you know, we need to be receptive and understanding of, of you know, the differences in the hockey world in particular. You know, hockey's been branded as the old white guys kind of uh, neighborhood, and and we got we need to make or be conscious of the fact that that's the perception, and that we need to be able to take whatever action we can 
you know, to try and be different, to try and be inclusive and, and, and treat things equitable. You know, we see this in a lot of different avenues and a lot of different areas of the game. And, and you know, the, the efforts that are there aren't, like I said, cookie cutter. You know, it's just not going to be done the same way in New York City as it is in Syracuse, New York or, or Buffalo or, or Albany. So it's going to be, you know, kind of a different approach. USA Hockey has actually gone to the uh, point of identifying uh, a growth uh, affiliate coordinator. So what they're trying to do is they're, they're tying diversity and inclusion into growth efforts. And, you know, that's one of the ways that you grow is to be inclusive. So they're trying to identify 37 different growth affiliate uh, coordinators across the country to try and generate some ideas that would work in their particular part of the country, but also to develop some best practices. So that if somebody in, you know, Western New York has a great idea on how to be more inclusive, then let's let's collect that documentation and that plan right. and let's share yeah. it with let's share it with people across the state and across the country. Because if it works there, it might work where I am too. And then that way we develop kind of a, you know, a whole smorgasbord of, of ways that we can kind of address the issue and, and maybe come up with a solution. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think, I think that got, that's the kind of stuff, you know, when I, when I, in my day-to-day -day world now, you know, just working with like the first nations programs with guys like, you know, Brian Trache and doing, you know, work like that and doing working with Blake Bolden, who's, you know, like the bold, bold program, which is like just a, just a program where, you know, she's doing a lot of diversity, uh, women's sports, things like that. And then obviously the work we do with ice hockey in Harlem and replicating that around the country and in New Jersey and Connecticut, you know, especially on the East coast here, but that's, that, that's a, a lot of that goes uh, right down to, you know, really going back to the conversation on the ADM, right. And having access and more, you know, opportunity for players at the grassroots level. I think one of the things that I found Joe too, with the, with the American development model, was and when we talk about the success of the national program and and world juniors and things like that but i think what what is overshadowed is the the vast new numbers of players in our sport that maybe aren't getting to the national level but they're involved in hockey thousands and thousands of kids it, it, you know girls and boys uh including uh you know sled hockey and and the special olympics and all this kind of stuff that happens where the more, I mean, we're, we're in a world where I think when you're a hockey coach and when you're a hockey parent, you're, you're in this little bubble of, you think everybody likes, you know, is so involved with hockey and there's not really that many people. And it's like, Oh my God, you know, you do what? And you go where, and you were at what tournament, you know, showcase, right? Lee <laughs> this weekend for, you know, nine games. So people think that, you know, most, a lot of hockey people are crazy, but I think the more people you get into the craziness and you understand that the, the, the only goal isn't to go pro, and the only goal isn't right. to play division one college hockey. The goal is to be in this community in a great sport. I think that's one of the things that the ADM model did because it forced organizations to just bring more people into the tent. And I think that's a, you know, I think that's a great aspect of what we've done with that. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, there, and there's challenges and there's limitations, you know, so the thing is, um, you know, cost is one of the things that USA hockey is, is very concerned about because hockey is not a cheap sport to play. So we, you know, we're trying to find ways and look at uh, you know, different directions and options to try to try and make the game uh, more affordable. Because let, let's face it, it's not cheap. And 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 anything we can do along those lines, anything we can do to to foster a love of the game, but also to try and uh, understand that we got to find ways to to break down the cost. You know, and that's something that's been uh, kind of on the forefront. You know, hockey's a pretty time, uh, time intense sport as well. You guys know as parents and players that, you know, if you're in, in hockey, you're, it's a 24 seven thing. So another aspect of the American development model is to, is to foster and create athletes that aren't necessarily, you know, hockey players 12 months out of the year that they that they play baseball they play soccer they work on their athleticism they work on other things to enjoy sport it doesn't necessarily have to be hockey but you know those are other challenges that we face across the board and and you know we're trying to trying to balance that we know in our at least in my opinion i think in your guys too hockey's probably the best sport in the world and we just got to make sure that, you know, it continues to be that way. And there's nothing wrong with kids being involved in, in, in other sports and make some better hockey players as well. So, you know, there are other challenges, but I think we're going down the right path. We're trying to do things the right way. Uh, we're trying to do uh, a number of different initiatives to make it better. And 
that's kind of the road we're walking. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll come in here and say this. You know, my son uh, just finished Adams and he's going into mites next year. Uh, and it was just pretty clear to me he needed a little bit of a break, especially after last season. It was a little bit of a unique season. We had a lot, lot more practices than games, or I should say we had less games than we would normally have in a, in a normal year. Uh, and, he, and he told me towards the end of the season that he likes it, but, you know, he's a little bored because we're doing something similar every time. So we're taking the summer off. He's going to do karate. He's going to do some other sports. I told his coach next year and, and correctly coach had no issue with it. He goes, yeah, that's great, man. You know, diversify, get out there, try some other things. He's seven. <laughs> I always come back to that. He's seven. Right. Um, you know, and, and going back to what Mike said, you know, uh, and, th and this is not just true of hockey. This is kind of just parenting and, and sports and, you know, success in general. But I, I always say too often, we're only looking at the tip of the spear. And we're not looking at the full sword or, or the full spear, right? Like, you know, Sidney Crosby, Connor McDavid, th these are 0.000001 percenters here, right? Like, like, that's not the right person to compare yourself with all the time. There's the whole sword and the whole development and the whole picture and the journey, which any player with their salt's going to tell you, the journey is the value. It's not just the game, right? Um, I want to switch here a little bit, Joe. I, I got to ask you about this. One of my favorite stories over the last month um, was the first female player being drafted into the OHL ever, right? You had a, a young goaltender drafted into major junior hockey. Uh, it was a major story. Again, never happened before um, in the history of junior hockey. And I know you have been uh, significantly involved in the women's and girls game throughout your life. So I would like you to tell us just the story of how you got involved in that and then the player development side of it and you know your life in, in women's hockey. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> as I said before, I, I got involved in the girls aspect of the game when uh, my daughter uh, started at six years old. I was a high school coach and uh, my daughter started to play and, and I obviously wanted to be involved in her growth and development. So when she was six, I took a little bit of a hiatus from the high school coaching game and joined the youth hockey ranks and, and actually uh, was my daughter's coach you know, right through high school. So I, I enjoyed that and uh, was able to do high school and that together. Uh, and at the New York state level, the lady that was in charge of the girls program uh, had to take a little bit of a sabbatical. So they asked if I would be interested in stepping into that role uh, because I had a daughter that was a hockey player. And I said, sure. So ever since then, I was, I, I've been a member of the uh, girls women's section, uh, which is kind of the driving force nationally for all girls women's programs. I've been really fortunate enough to, to be involved on in the player development side and, and meet a number of higher level female athletes. I'm pretty good friends with a, with a number of Olympians and, and uh, a good friend of mine is Ben Smith, who is a uh, national team coach and Olympic coach on the, on the women's side. And just by being around those athletes, uh, they take the game so seriously and they are so focused on skill, nutrition. They're just like any other athlete. They know, they realize that if I want to get to the highest level, there are sacrifices that have to be made. You know, the, I, I talk to the ladies all the time and they would tell me, you know, I had to miss my junior prom because I had to go to a, a, a training session. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't go out with my friends and party on a Saturday night because I was truly focused on getting that division one scholarship and, and knowing that if I want to get to that level, it takes a lot of hard work. And to your guys' point, you know, the percentage of players that get to that point, is, it's, min it's minuscule. So not only do you have to love the game and, and be involved in, and having a great time with it, but you also have to be dedicated to, to under and understand that there's going to be a lot of work to be able to be that 1% of player that, that gets to play, you know, at the, at the Division One college level and have my education played for. And then if I'm even lucky enough to go past that, to, to represent the United States of America and, and wear the red, white, and blue in a jersey. So, you know, that's <clears throat> the girls on that side, they're in a fight at the highest level. You know, so there's, there's the, the attempt to try and have a professional women's league and, and the quality of players that are there uh, are, is growing. I think that we're near the point where, where we want to be able to do that. The NHL is seriously interested in, in, in trying to help fund and, and, and create and, and foster and grow the women's game professionally, kind of like the WNBA. You know, so I think that it's there. The women are, 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 are proud. They take a stand. They understand, too, that 
there's a fight there. You know, if you want to train and be a professional athlete, you know, you, you, you can't do that on $8,000 a year. You know, you need to be able to, 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 to earn enough money to be a professional athlete, to, to, to be able to live and pay your bills. Right. And so that's kind of the struggle that a lot of those ladies have right now is that they want to be that highest level athlete, but they also have to face the realities of life. So, right. you know, the, the, so, so that's the struggle that they, that they face. Uh, but it's just, it's, it's amazing. They, and, and the skill level that's there, uh, you know, perfect example is Kendall Coyne, who was in the fastest skater in the all-star, you know, in the fastest skater competition at, at the NHL all-star game and actually beat a number of NHL players. So, I mean, the skill level is actually there. Are, are the, are the guys bigger, faster, and stronger? Yeah. But the girls also have a high level of skill. So it's just amazing to watch them play. I've been, I've been lucky enough to go to the national development camps and watch them actually perform. And these players are just phenomenal and they love the sport. They love the sport. I'm also encouraged, Joe, to see how many colleges are now opening the doors to women playing hockey, D3 level. So many more colleges have added women's hockey uh, to their um, sports programs, which is really exciting. So, um, so girls shouldn't get discouraged in high school. And if, you, if you're not at that D1 level, there are many, many, many opportunities to play club hockey, Division Three hockey. Um, Sophia had lots and lots of opportunities. There are many colleges that are now adding programs, which is really exciting to see. So there's, that's that's cool. Women's hockey's growing at, at many levels, not just at the highest level. Um, but we still have that, you know, that prejudice out there because just the other day, um, somebody had asked Sophia, "Oh, do you play a sport?" Yes, I play hockey. Oh, you play field hockey. No, I play <laughs> ice hockey. And then yeah. they look, girls play ice. So they're still out there that, that people don't understand. They, yes, girls, yeah. women play ice hockey. You know, <laughs> it's, yeah. still a, it's still a big Christy, question out there. You, that, you know, one of, the, one of the stigmas I wanted to bring up. By the way, Joe, we'll go over the irony of your your daughter being a pediatric dentist and a hockey player. That's that is <laughs> that is an amazing I love that, one two way. punch right there. But you know, one of, one of the stigmas, and I want to bring this up because I I I I I have a feeling there's people who listen to this show that could you know could hear this is that when we talk about fighting for the women's game uh, in the hockey communities um, I run, a lot of times I get this answer: they'll never be as big as the NHL, and I go, that is so not the point. <laughs> That is not what anyone is is saying. That is not what anybody is talking about. Um, we're talking about a that hockey is hockey. That whether you're a male or a female and you play hockey, you're a hockey player, right? Gender does not matter in that that equation, right? And then what you said that that women at the professional level are just fighting for a livable wage. They're not fighting to make fifty two million dollars and have thirty thousand fans. Maybe one day. All right, I'm not taking that off the table. But we're talking about a livable wage. I just, I never understood that stigma from some of the fans of like, no one's going to watch that. I, by the way, when people say that, I go, have you ever watched an NWHL game or, or, a, or a, a Dream Gap tour? Have you ever watched the Olympics? Because it's fun, it's awesome, and it's hockey. So either you're a fan of the sport or you're not. I, I always go into that. But yeah, I just wanted to comment on that because that's part of the stigma is that uh, they're not going to make millions. And it's like, what does that even matter? What, what are we doing here? And, you know, look, I, I have a daughter, um, you know, and, and she's going to get involved. I can already tell because she, I could, I've just seen her pick up the stick enough times to know she's going to want to do it. And it's like, you know, I think about her future. I, I think there's a lot of fathers and mothers with daughters that play the game that see that like, this is just about sport and being included and the life lessons and should they want to go farther? You said it, you know, understanding the sacrifices you need to make to be a professional athlete. The road for women with that is far harder than men, right? And, and I think there's a lot we can learn from each other. I, I do want to bring a question up here. I just felt like I had to say that. Um, but th this is one of those questions that, that I want to ask on behalf of the audience. It might come across to some as almost an unfair question, but it's one that needs to be asked because people probably are afraid to ask that. And Joe, the question is, you know, do you see differences coaching at the girls level or the, and the boys level, right? I can see coaches out there not wanting to ask that because there might not be any differences, but you've been involved with both sides of the game. Uh, what are the differences, if any, between coaching women and men or girls and boys? 
So, so I can tell you this, that uh, in interviewing a number of Olympic female athletes uh, who have been asked, you know, would you rather have a girl's coach or, or a boy's coach? A, you know, girl, a, a woman head coach or a boy head coach. The female athlete says, I just want the best coach. There you go. I don't care. I don't, I don't care if, I don't care if it's a female. I don't care if the, if the guy coaching me is a man or a woman. I just want the best coach. And, and, and there, there certainly are differences. Um, the, the primary difference that uh, is noticeable is that girls tend to be more uh, sponges, especially at the younger ages. They want to learn. They want to listen. They want to, uh, and that's also part of the the uh, physical, social, and, and mental development of girls at a younger age. They mature sooner, so they're they're more attuned into the learning process. They want to soak up and 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 be involved in the learning part of it, uh, where boys kind of take it a little bit for granted. Uh, so that's one of the big differences, you know. But but you got to think about. Uh, Girls have always had the, had the opportunity. Another thing that they talk about is uh, that growing up, they wanted to play with people of the same skill because they wanted to get better. So it didn't really matter if they were on a boys team or a girls team. They just wanted to be playing against players of either gender that were of the same competitive level. So they don't want to go and be the dominant. They want to be with players that are the same skill so that they can get better and that they can, uh, you know, work cooperatively as a team. You know, girls have, under, have undergone a lot of kind of biases. If you think about it, growing up, uh, my daughter would have to get dressed in a in a in a bathroom or in you know in a in a, in a broom closet uh, before she could join the team. So that was you know that was certainly a, an issue there. And, and you know, there's other issues that 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 girls are. It's kind of uncomfortable as a, as a male, <laughs> because you know the, you go into the locker room and they wear sports bras and 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 this kind of stuff, and they and they have no fear about being you know exposed like that. And yet you're a male and you're feeling uncomfortable. So there's establishing guidelines and rules and regulations. So you know the the, the players just want to be treated as players. That's all they want, and they want to be in a situation that's competitive, and they want a situation that's equitable. So they don't want to have to be in a different locker room. They want to be in the locker room getting dressed with their team. They want to be uh, playing with players that are at the same level that they're at, or maybe a little bit better. So, so the women, their attitude is, is, you know, it's not really, uh, they're, they're hockey players or hockey players, be right. it be female or male. And, and, and there really isn't a lot of difference, uh, but there is kind of just in the attitude and the culture that surrounds that whole, that whole situation. So it's not such a difference in players uh, and, and the way that they learn. It's, it's, it's more about the culture and, and the perceptions that, you know, th that kind of wall that we're trying to break down a little bit. I love it. You know, when I played, I remember when I was a first, no, second year Bantam, uh, we had, a, we had a, a girl on the team and she was one of the best players on the team. And, uh, you know, maybe I benefited from always uh, being surrounded by strong women my whole life. My mother is an incredibly strong woman, uh, both, you know, as a person. Uh, you know, Vicky, the girl on the team was really good. I looked up to her. Uh, my wife is an incredibly strong person that I love. She's always joke. She's only five, two or whatever, but I look up to her. You know what I mean? Uh, and I, you know, that's, that's part of breaking the stigma is just, I grew up in a, in a, in an environment where there was no difference between women and men. They we were just there, you know what I mean? But, you know, I think one of the things I've learned from coaching um, is that sometimes you got to take it out of your own experience. Like you just said, how often as coaches do you think about the girl who's getting dressed in the bathroom and what that must be like for her? Sometimes we just don't think about it because it's not our experience. It's not a fault of anyone. But can you open your mind up of what does that person have to go through to, to be part of the team? And obviously, this is not limited to just hockey. You know, again, my wife is a physician. Watching her become a doctor, go through the military to become a doctor and then negotiate for jobs, it's a totally different experience than it, it would be for me. I mean, I'll never be a doctor, right? Been playing hockey too many years. But my point to you is that, you know, watching someone else go through an experience can teach you a lot about A, how to coach them, how to mentor them, or how you can be mentored by them, right? Um, Mike, I want to throw it to you too. I mean, again, I'm going to switch it up. And Joe, you, you've been a phenomenal guest so far, just invaluable information. Uh, we did say that you, you won the Yaw Chuck Award. Now, in, 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 in stark contrast, and instead of having you talk about yourself and 
that award, which would just not be good, right? Because as, as we spoke before the show, Joe, and you said uh, totally, totally correctly that, you know, you didn't expect to win that. That's typically how people win those awards, right? I'm going to throw all the pressure on Mike Benelli because because right. he threw this episode on me last minute, which was the best thing he could have done. And, and, and you know, he and I buddy around. And Christy and I really like to put the pressure on Mike. You can see he's turning a shade of red now for the those of you listening. But, no, Mike, seriously, I wanted you to just talk about Joe. And, and, and you know, he won this a pretty prestigious award. Uh, I just want you to, you know, geek out on him for a minute because I know you look up to him. You're really excited to have him on the show today. And, you know, let us know how you think about it. Yeah, well, so it's easy because Joe – Joe and bodies. I mean, honestly, what Joe and bodies, what the, the, the coaching education program is about. I mean, for, and, you know, I, I think what he brings too. you know, I, I love the fact that, you know, we can learn a lot about how you teach and, you know, being in workshops with Joe and, and, and obviously watching them online this past year. And, and, you know, we don't get to see, you know, to Joe's point about even the coaching education program about, you know, the, the coaches getting to be in different rooms with Californians and Floridians and, and, uh, and Floridians and guys from Iowa and girls from, Alaska, you know, we as, as coach educators get to, we, even in New York state, we're such a large district that we often don't get to be in the same room together when we do our programming. So I think what Joe's done, you know, from that point of view, from a, you know, listening from all of us, listening to him on how he speaks to the coaches and, and, and things that he can give us to help us teach has been invaluable. And I think the, the awards is definitely, I mean, you look at all the coaches and the coach educators and the coach developers around the country. I, I think, you know, I think even one of the one of the uh, descriptions was, you know, the 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 long time, you know, uh, you know, it's not a it's not a longevity award. I, I think it's a it's an award, you know, f- for me the way I look at it is based off of what he's done and his body of work he's done for the coaching education program. Uh, he's got a great personality for it. I think you do, you know, even off off the coaching education part, you know, he brings a nice light. Um, you know, feeling to the room where it doesn't have, this doesn't have to be, you know, an assignment that you have to do. Now you don't have to coach. Uh, You don't have to help be a coach developer. You have to make it fun. You have to make an environment that's inviting. And, and at the end of the day, I think one of the things that he's always done, and I've always liked listening to him, you know, privately and in the coaching program side of things is that, you know, we're here to help coaches facilitate being better coaches for the kids that we, that Joe's eventually going to meet again, right? And the women's side, the more work he's done with the coaching education program to develop all, you know, more girls and women in sport is going to end up helping him later on in the day because all he's going to see all those 14, 15, 16 year old girls. Uh, and, and he's done, if you look at the numbers, uh, it's been a tremendous job of what he's done on moving girls from the New York state program up to the national rank. So, you know, congratulations again, Joe. And I think, uh, you know, I think anybody in the, in the coaching education program and the player development side, you know, can learn a lot from just listening to you and, and, and certainly being around you for sure. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. And, and I told Lee earlier and you guys earlier, it's, 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 it was an honor and, and uh, kind of the, kind of a shocking thing. I was a little embarrassed, but uh, those are things that, that, cause, cause let's face it, none of us involved in this uh, little show today do what we do, Uh, for the money you know we're not going to become millionaires doing what we do so we do it for the love of the sport and for the kids and and that's you know that's why it was it was humbling and and uh i was grateful to to be recognized in that way so joe to round this episode out you're you're approaching uh it started to date you here your fourth decade of volunteer service within this game (laughs) Um, so like, again, we said 27 years of volunteer, which is incredible. That, that, that is, that is a testament to you alone. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, right. You've seen the past of the game. Where do you see the game going? We've talked a lot about obviously inclusion and diversity today and development, but you know, over the next 30 years, where do you hope the game will be? What do you see as the kind of bright beacon at the top of the hill for hockey? So uh, the ultimate goal and the ultimate measure of how well we do in New York state and how well we do in USA hockey uh, is kind of looked at, at the, at the, on the girl's side at the Olympic level and at the guy's side in the NHL. So, you know, one of the goals of USA hockey is, is is to have a much higher uh, percentage of Americans playing at that level and for, for women uh, to, to keep piling up the gold medals at the international level you know, both in the world championships at every level, U18, U22, and, and, and women's national team, uh, and, and, and in the Olympics as well. So, I mean, you know, 
I think uh, with a continued effort uh, to implement and, and develop uh, the American development model and to focus on the long-term athlete development strategy that we have in place that you know, we'll be able to reach those goals and, and, and we're going to be able to see uh, you know, a ton more Americans playing at the highest level. And that's ultimately, that's kind of a measure of how well we do uh, as coaches, as parents, as players, you know, in our system that we have here in New York State and, and, and across the country. So you know, I, I see nothing but positive growth uh, you know, we, we, our, our, our numbers are going to grow. You know, there's been some projections that our numbers are going to be down about uh, 20% because of the pandemic across the country. And there's a goal to have that number be back at pre-pandemic levels, you know, within two years. So, you know, we just want to focus on continuing to grow the game and, and, and measuring our successes and our abilities at the highest level. And, uh, you know, that's one of the measuring tools. But to the points that were made way earlier, you know, 95% of our, of our population never gets to play in a national championship. They never get to play in the NHL. They never get, you know, they're recreational players and they do it for the fun and the love of the sport. And as long as we can continue to, to focus on uh, keeping hockey fun, uh, we'll just have to celebrate the greatest game on the greatest game on the planet in that way, making it fun and enjoyable. And that's, you know, hopefully the way it's going to go. Well, I was going to say, if there's any wonder why you won that 2021 Walter Yawchuk Award, now we all know the answer to that, even though you're a little embarrassed about it, which again is probably a prerequisite. But Mike and Christy, I want to give you guys the final word. Any other uh, final yeah, thoughts? Wait, here? wait, we can't. Yeah. Lee, you teased everybody on this. We can't let them go until we find out, <laughs> did hockey influence your daughter in becoming a pediatric <laughs> dentist? I'm dying to know. <laughs> Well, actually, actually, my father did. My father was a dentist as well. So, so, so that was the, that was the kind of the connection there. Yeah. Well, I'll say well, it. congratulations again. But, and, you know, he's described as a tireless volunteer. Boy, we sure need more Joe Epolitos in this game of hockey. Um, so thank you for being such an inspiration and for sharing your knowledge. I learned so much and it's exciting to look at the future especially the way that you paint it. It's a, it's a great picture that you painted for the future of hockey. Thank you, Joe. Well, I appreciate being on. I, I appreciate the chat. It's always good to talk about hockey. And I'll, I'll say as a final word, all of us either have all of our original teeth or our dentures in right now. So everybody's got a very nice <laughs> smile on this show. Uh, uh, Mike, any final words before we move on? No, I think it's great. I, I, Joe, really appreciate you being on and, and, and uh, you know, fitness in. And I think it's, uh, you know, we're, we're going to look forward to watching, you know, the evolution of uh, USA Hockey and your involvement. And I think just, uh, you know, the good things that are going to come over the summer and into next year. And I think everybody could be excited about that. And knowing that we got through a, uh, a tough year, ready to rebound and, and start having some fun again. So that's going to do it for this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. Joe Apolito, you've been a fantastic guest. Again, sometimes the last minute ones really are the best ones, and I appreciate that uh, for you being here today. Uh, for Christy Casciano Burns and Mike Benelli, I'm Lee Elias. Again, you've been listening to Our Kids Play Hockey. Check us out on ourkidsplayhockey.com. You can listen or watch this podcast literally wherever podcasts are available. We're everywhere. Uh, thanks so much for listening, and we will see you on the next edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Have a great day, everybody.